it is my honor to introduce the next speaker. Um, he is uh, the uh, uh, head of emergency general surgery and the, uh, the director of the trauma program at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. Um, he is also um, a very active American College of Surgeons. He chairs the uh, Verification Review Committee for the American College of Surgeons, which, as many of you know, is an extremely prestigious position to hold. And it is the, it is the committee that basically determines what uh, trauma centers are verified trauma centers in the United States. Um, uh, he has been past president of the um, Southwestern Surgical Congress. Um, he has participated in multiple uh, multi-institutional research trials and has uh, had um, several, has had uh, numerous funding sources, including uh, uh, co-investigator uh, funding for the National Institute of Health. Um, he's also um, past president of the um, of, of his local American College of Surgeons chapter in California. Um, he is a, a reviewer for multiple um, important journals, including the, uh, the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery. Um, he is guest editor for, the, um, uh, for, the, for American Surgeon for the uh, uh, Southern California chapter meeting. Um, and uh, um, we are honored to uh, have him uh, talk to us today about liver injury. And so without further ado, Oh, yeah. that was harder to do without my notes. <laughs> How do you admit? Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your inviting me out here. It's a pleasure to be here. If any of you have questions along the way, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. Um, this is for your education. So um, I'm going to start. I'm following Peter Ree, which is always uh, not an easy thing to do. I don't have all the videos that he does. I'm going to talk about liver injury. And remarkably, um, he and I agree on a number of things. In fact, usually what Peter thinks is really similar to the way I think. I'm going to talk about liver injury, and we're going to get a little bit into the damage control that he was discussing today. Um, I'm kind of, this is kind of a large topic in a short time. So I'll, I'll kind of go through the slides a little bit fast. If, but uh, if you want me to stop or have questions, please let me know. Um, it's changed over time, which is what my point is here. Um, this is some of the history. Um, really, when we started operating on the liver for injury in the end of the uh, 19th century, there was very little we were doing other than packing and sometimes resection. And we'll kind of come back to that packing uh, theory. Uh, more recently. And then it changed, and in 1908, as Dr. Ree mentioned, Dr. Pringle mentioned, wrote this paper, this is the actual picture of the initial paper that he wrote describing the Pringle maneuver, which we stopped the inflow to the liver from the porta hepatis, allowing us to see a more bloodless field in the liver injury. And then you can see some of the statistics here on the mortality over the years, um, especially the, the conflicts, World War II mortality from liver injury reported to be 27%, then has come down. Korean conflict, Vietnam, down to 8%. And modern concepts following this were trauma centers. Before, as Dr. Ree was mentioning with the EMS in the 19... Uh, 60s, before that, we really didn't have trauma centers. They went to the local hospital, and you had experienced people or not. And uh, we started coalescing the patients to trauma centers. So that's the, the current methodology we use, as you're familiar with. So a little bit about the epidemiology, classification, initial management, and then treatment strategies, which are either operative or non-operatively, or what we do nowadays, which is more multidisciplinary. And just in terms of the liver itself, it's kind of the largest organ in the abdomen, carries a lot of weight and space, and therefore if you have a penetrating in, um, projectile, is likely to be one of the things injured. It is kind of protected in terms of the rib cage, almost from all the way around. If you look at it, it's protected, and there's a reason for that. It's soft and mushy and will crack. Okay, so uh, as we were developing, I think, with uh, maybe clubs, it was pretty well protected. But now with cars uh, and seat belts, 
the impacts are so much greater that blunt injury is a big problem for the liver. And of course, a projectile that goes right through um, the abdomen is likely to hit the liver. So blunt and penetrating is common. Um, the anatomy has been broken down here. I'm not going to spend the time because I have a lot of slides to go through, but you can see it's kind of complex with a lot of vessels, um, both arterial, portal, and then in the back there, the venous outflow. There's a few other um, things with anatomy. Cantley's line describes the right, between the right and left lobes. Kuhnout in 1953 described the functional segments as I just showed. And to, to note, the hepatic artery, when most, most things depend on the artery for its oxygenation, but in the liver, only 25% of the, of the uh, it, apply, it, it only provides um, half of the oxygenation needed for the liver and 25% of the hepatic blood flow because the portal vein actually has oxygen in it and therefore when the hepatic artery is occluded, it still can survive. So in addition, there's a number of aberrant arterial anatomy, which is uh, important, more than a, a fourth. And then the portal vein is you know, formed by the confluence of the splenic vein and the and superior mesenteric vein. This supplies most of the blood flow, 75%, and again, half of the oxygenation. So it's kind of an interesting uh, anatomy. And then there are these ligaments that you can look up. It just uh, This is what's holding the liver from falling down into our pelvis. And then analysis of, of the patients by mechanism. These are some really large studies done in the early part of this uh, this decade and even into the last decade. And you can see the large number of patients, but the, and, and it's important when you're looking at these kind of studies to see what is the mechanism. So about a third uh, in general of these large studies were stab wounds to the liver. And about half um, were gunshot wounds, with blunt being the major minority at uh, 11, 10, 15. Um, but up in more recently, up in San Francisco, up to 40%. And the blunt injuries actually have been coming up in the, the percentage over time. Now, if you look at mortality, most patients do not die from a stab wound to the liver. So uh, uh, that last slide showed 30% of these studies showing mortality. It's real important to see the mechanism. So if 30% of the study is stab wounds, very few patients die from stab wound to the liver these days. Um, and this is, this is old work here, one uh, percent, okay? Gunshot wounds a little bit more. Certainly it's more difficult to, to stem bleeding from gunshot wounds. It can do a lot of damage. But still, six, uh, these are really large studies, six to 10 percent, 15 percent of the mortality is from gunshot wounds and much higher mortality for those fewer patients that had the blunt hit mechanism. So, so a 20, 25% mortality, depending on the severity of the liver injury. Now, it also depends on the associated injury. Associated injuries are common, and they can affect mortality significantly. So I, I, you may not be able to see this, but associated mortalities, head injury, 20%, chest injuries, 50%, Pelvic fractures, 22%. So that's really important. And if you look at the number of associated injuries with the liver injury, the mortality down to liver itself, 6% in all comers in general. But as you progressively go up, one, two, three, other associated injuries, the mortality goes up. If you have more than five significant other organs injured, mortality is up to 67%. So that's important. And what's happened over time? I said I was going to give you a little back then and now. And this was a, um, the Scudder oration by, given by Dr. Da J. David Richardson in, uh, in the 2005, which analyzed from no early 19th century on. And it showed that really the, liver, the total mortality is come from liver injury has come down. And in the end, on the very bottom, in the, in the, in the bottom is the liver-related injury, so that most recently, mortality has come down from 50% down to less than 
Now, why is this? Um, we're going to go into this a little bit more in detail. The cause of injury, first of all, the cause of death, first of all, in general, early on, is from bleeding, as you'd expect. And then after 48 hours, fewer patients die from these liver injuries, but the, the deaths is from organ failure. What are the risk factors? Well, if they come in in shock with a base deficit more than six, that's a significant 20-fold increase in them dying, or operative blood loss for more than five liters. Not unexpected, okay? There is uh, the classification, I'm not gonna spend the time to go through, you're familiar with it as, as published in the AAST and then revised once, but this is the classification, so you have grades one through six. Never much talk about grade six liver injury, that's a complete hepatic avulsion. Those patients are usually dead, but it's in the grading system. And you can see the frequency is there on the right. Most of the patients have minor or not severe liver injury, 15 at grade one, grade two is 55%, 20% grade three. So smaller majority have the grade four and five severe liver injuries. This has changed if you're ever analyzing this over time because in the early times before we spent a lot of time getting CT scans, the liver injury was either diagnosed in the operating room or on autopsy. So we didn't see these small liver injuries. Now you see every little crack in the liver on the CT scan very well. So over time, these smaller injuries have become more frequent. And just to show you what it means here, if you can barely see on the bottom, this grade one injury with the small thing in the back of the right lobe of the liver, grade two, a little bit more severe, and with some blood around it between the liver and the kidney, which you'd see on a fast exam, uh, ultrasound, and a grade three becoming more severe pretty much through the parenchyma with some hemorrhage inside of the liver ongoing. And grade four, now it's, that's a really serious injury. Half of the liver is not even being vascularized. And there's ongoing bleeding and a blush there. And then in grade five, okay, so that's pretty awful. So you have a little bit of the left lobe, which is, which is perfused, and a little bit of the right. So the mortality for these severe injuries is significant. And you can see, uh, as studied there, 25% for grade three up to 80% for grade five. But due to the liver alone, attributed to the liver, maybe only 6% of the grade three would die, but up to 66% in the grade five. So those are still a reason for patients to die. And, and Dr. Ree mentioned this. It's one of the few things that we still have patients die from, head injury, pelvic fracture, aortic tear, and liver injuries. So what is the mortality related to? Well, it's related to the amount of parenchymal damage, the initial injury, and sometimes what we do. So the operative interventions. In particular, when the hepatic veins are injured, it's a pretty high mortality. So it's, I hope we have time to get into this, but what do we, how do we take care of these patients? Well, resuscitation is standard, okay? You can do your ABCs, get your ATLS, you know, get some venous access. If you're in Peter's shop, don't give them any fluid. You might get a chest X-ray and a KUB, and then how do we diagnose it? Okay, well, what we used to do was the DPL. We don't do that anymore if you have an ultrasound machine looking for blood in the abdomen. It just tells you whether there's blood in the abdomen. If you have an unstable patient, then you have to make a decision. If you don't have an, if he's not unstable, you can get some imaging further with a CT scan, which tells you a lot about the injury. It doesn't treat the patient, but it tells you a lot about the injury. And then there are these algorithms, you know, if they're unstable, go to the OR. If not, um, uh, you can do some workup. So you can see the FAST stand showing some blood between the kidney and the liver. So at least you know there's blood in the abdomen. It may be due to the liver, maybe due to the spleen or something else. What are the principles if you do have to operate? Well, again, most of this liver bleeding is, you know, most of the liver stops bleeding and um, don't need a whole lot. So if you can avoid an operation, and I'll get to that, you can, that may help the patient. 
If you do have to operate because of instability, then what we have is a graded approach. There are many different things you can do, and this has changed a bit over time. And what we do in general is tailor the amount that we do to the injury. And there's multiple techniques. So one thing is to not limit yourself by a small incision. We do a wide prep. You don't know what you're going to get into. You might have to open the chest. The long midline incision in general is the best. You control the hemorrhage, as Dr. Ree showed on that previous one. That was not the liver so much, although it was injured. Control the hemorrhage. That's the goal. You know, okay. How do we do that? Mobilize the liver and then try to figure out what you need to do. So ATLS algorithm shows, uh, you know, as, he, as Dr. Ree mentioned, we used to give a lot of fluid. Now, not so much. Permissive hypotension came out in 1994. It's a long time ago already. And we still may not be using it as much as we could. Meaning, um, don't get that blood pressure up and make them bleed more. If you don't have to, get them to the operating room where you can stop the bleeding. So it revealed improved survival with penetrating torso injuries, mixed results in blunt trauma, and be um, careful for this treatment in head injured patients or elderly patients. But what do we do? We start with the physical exam. If they really have peritoneal signs or the hemodynamic instability, then you do need to take them to the operating room. And in the operating room, the initial control is, that pair of hands is you know, in a lot of textbooks. It's useful. Get some packs in and your hands and stop the bleeding until you can figure out what it is that's injured. So holding the liver closed often will stop the bleeding. Now, how do you? operate if your two hands are holding the liver. It's, it's useful to get some help. <laughs> two sets of hands is very helpful in liver injury. I mean, when we get, talk about mobilizing the liver, that takes two hands to pull it up. Okay, so that it's very helpful. Now this is showing the Pringle maneuver as described in 1908. And what it does is occlude the inflow to the liver from the hepatic artery and the portal vein. So now all of the inflow is occluded, okay? And then the liver should be dry. Now you can look at that crack and do what you need to do to it. Um, again, this is a portal vein and the hepatic arterial. And yet, if you're looking at the crack and it's still bleeding, then you have to be worried that in fact, the bleeding's from something else, meaning what else is going to be bleeding, and that could be the veins from the liver itself, which are connected to the IVC. And if that's bleeding, now it's a bigger problem. Now, how long can you keep that clamp on? Well, we don't like to keep it on too long. We don't like the liver to be ischemic, but you can leave it on 15, 20 minutes without really a problem. You can even uh, give the liver a drink and uncl unclamp it for a while and then reclamp it. So a, an extended incision, rarely done now. I really usually use midline. But we mobilize the liver if, it, if, if this, is, um, this is one of the ways we do it. We divide the paddock ligaments, get a retractor, and then this is how, how we do it. So you start by taking down these ligaments of falciform, the lateral ligaments there. And then, like I say, most of the liver injuries can be done with simple techniques, um, electrocautery, Hemostasis, ag hemostatic agents, su suturing, and um, this usually takes care of it, over 70%. But complex injuries, these grade three to five, now either need what we used to do, which is a direct approach and try to repair it, or damage control techniques. Now, Dr. Reese spent an hour telling you not to do damage control, but I don't think he really meant not to do it. He just meant don't leave the abdomen open. So some of the techniques in damage control mean don't fix everything. In fact, some of this can be like you were with your hands holding the liver closed. Just replace your hands with packs and pack the liver. So venous bleeding is at a lower pressure and holding pressure can stop that bleeding. If that occurs, why pull the liver up, expose that hole in the vein, and try to sew it up. Because what happens when you do that is they're bleeding a lot. Now you're into the five liter blood loss and the high mortality. And so we used to attempt to fix all of these. And what's changed most recently is we don't. We really try uh, to 
use a damage control technique, pack the liver, and then potentially use some other techniques. So these are the, what I was describing, hepatography. You can sew the liver up. That's what Dr. Ree was showing in the case he did. You can do resectional debridement. You can put in omentum. That's something that w can fill a space that can be helpful. You, can, uh, you have to be careful for these subcapsular hematomas. They can spread and become quite big and break and be, bleed a lot. So uh, you want to take care of those. You can take a portion of the liver out. We tend not to do this uh, type of uh, debridement unless we have to, unless the liver is really, really badly injured and basically falling apart, then you, t you have to remove part of it. Again, uh, some of the techniques we have is to ligate the hepatic artery. We don't do this rare, r routinely anymore. We used to do it more, but we really don't. And one of the reasons is the use of angiography. If you pack the liver, you can do, have radiology help do this in a more selected match. But it's an option, and you should have it in your armamentarium and know where it is. So this is the right hepatic artery, still leaving the left hepatic artery intact. You could wrap it. That's rarely done anymore but this is an absorbable mesh, replacing your hands with that pack or wrap. And then what about these hepatic vein injuries? Again, these are the ones that kill patients. So the high mortality, they have an intrahepatic or extrahepatic portion, and you have different options. You can try to go in and repair it. You can do vascular isolation. So I said we can stop the inflow to the liver from the port of hepatis, but we can also stop the inflow and outflow of the liver from the vein, vein, venous, venous side by getting control of the liver below and above, the inferior vena cava below the liver and the uh, suprahepatic inferior vena cava. If you occlude those, you have now occluded the entire liver and you have a total liver isolation, then you could work on it. This also cuts back all the flow to the, to the heart from the lower uh, body, so it's not real well tolerated, but it is an option. Also, closing down the aorta may help you if you can do this before even getting to the operating room. Now we do this with Reboa. Atrial cable shunt is not commonly used and no one has that much experience, so I'm not gonna talk about it. But damage control is the other option. So again, these are the veins in the back of the liver that could be cracked and bleeding. You can get to them either through the injury directly or from the back. So this is the retrohepatic inferior vena cava, and it's got a tie around it. And I'll just show it to you because so much has been said about it, but it's pretty small. This is the liver mobilized, and you're looking at the cava behind it, and it's not that big of a space. But if it's torn, you have a problem. Now, if you do this and it's got a hole in it, you're seeing a lot of blood. So you have to have isolated the liver first. The other option is not to do this, just to leave it alone and put some pressure on the liver. And what I showed you about the survival coming down, uh, um, survival increasing mortality coming down recently is because I think we've stopped trying to repair all these and we pack them more. So this is my, that slide again from Dr. Richardson showing that w once we stop doing so much of this direct repair, we've actually gotten a better mortality. So this is a, um, from an, one of his studies showing that the placing the shunt, the, the, um, you had an 8% more survival. Packing, you had 61% and direct repair, 41. So packing actually did better than direct repair. It's something to consider. And so the mortality is related to interventions, the time, the blood loss. So perihepatic packing, how do you do it? You, well, you put some, some packs above the liver, you put it below the liver, and you stop the bleeding. And um, you're trying to avoid this hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy cycle. You leave them in too long, you risk infection, but you can leave them in until it stops bleeding, which is generally a day or two, and then go back and take them out. So the other thing you can do is take them to angiography and do some hepatic arterial embolization. This hepatic packing is really helpful to stop the bleeding, but it was always a quandary to me why we do, when we talked about damage control, why we try to pack, but then we leave the abdomen open. And this is what 
Dr. Ree was addressing is that, well, maybe we don't have to leave the abdomen open. If we can close it, we're now creating some tamponade, which is stopping the bleeding. We don't want too much. We don't want abdominal compartment syndrome. But if we don't give all that fluid, then we're doing what we want, which is stopping the bleeding without causing visceral swelling. And this is an example of what it shows. So the packing is there, the liver packs. Now, what about non-operative management? If we can avoid operating in general, they actually do better. So it's effective. There's generally a low risk of missed injuries. You have to be worried about missed injuries when you don't operate. If you operate, you see what's injured. When you don't, you're not so sure. But with CT scans, we've, we're much more confident. When there's a significant bleeding from the liver, often there's not that a real low incidence of other visceral injuries if it's blunt and not penetrating. So the goal is to be organ specific. Um, and again, you have to look at the differences between blunt and penetrating. When do we operate on, when do we use non-operative management? Well, for blunt, we use it commonly. For penetrating, not so commonly, but if it's tangential and it missed everything in the abdomen but the liver, we could consider it. So if they're valuable and they're stable, they're not having ongoing transfusions, minimal transfusions, they have monitoring capabilities in the ICU and a responsible surgeon to follow the patient, then we try non-operative management. And again, in over 80% of liver injuries these days, we'll try this, and we're successful in generally uh, over 70% overall, which is 90% of those in which we try it. So if we've selected them for non-operative management, they don't have, they're not dying of shock, they're not bleeding to death, then we can try this and the liver can stop bleeding. The failures generally are related to really high injury grade or significant hemoperitoneum or when there's significant contrast extravasation as I showed you on some of those slides. But the outcome has been improved since we've been doing this. There's lower length of stay, lower infection, lower transfusions in general. We used to operate on much more of these patients. Now we don't and they do better. And we have help. So there's angiography, as I mentioned, with embolization of paddock artery as needed. If the liver crack starts to leak bile and they have a complication, of, that can be treated with CT-guided drainage later. So we use these multidisciplinary techniques to help us. You might even have to do ERCP and make sure there's no other um, ductal injury. And sometimes even they may need to have laparoscopy. But these multidisciplinary techniques are what we use now. Primary therapy, they can be used for stopping the bleed. It can be adjunctive to the operation. So if you packed the liver, then took them to the ICU, but they still had the ongoing issue, you can then still use angiography, find out if there's ongoing bleeding, which can be treated that way without having to open up the whole liver and cause more bleeding. Or it can be an adjunct to the non-operative management. And it can be used for these complications, which can happen for either operative or non-operative. So these abdominal complications can be either vascular, there can be aneurysms, there can be fistulas, there can be biliary leaks, there can be abscesses and infections, and we have to deal with them. But that's in general how we do it, and I'm going to stop there. I had more, but I wanted to not go over my time. So in summary, uh, these are common injuries, partly because the liver is so big and partly because we have so many patients that undergo blunt mechanisms. And what we do is a graded operative approach non-operative when we can. If we have to operate, we do the simplest techniques first and then add more advanced as needed. And the complex injuries still remain a technical challenge and are formidable. Um, but there's an increasing role for both non-operative management and these multidisciplinary therapies. So I'm going to stop there and I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>